Welcome to SNC's Power Up webinar on the evolution of underground switchgear insulation technology. My name is Spencer Zirkelbach, and I will be your host for today's webinar and want to start off by saying thank you to everyone who has joined us here today. We have a wide range of attendees from electric power utilities, public power, the Department of Energy, media, and consultancies. Before we begin, I have a few administrative items to cover. This webinar is being recorded and a recording will be shared after the event along with a helpful, or helpful underground distribution switchgear comparison tool. Attendees are, will also be sent a brief one question survey. We would greatly appreciate a few seconds of your time to provide feedback on today's content. Attendee microphones are muted and we have turned off the chat feature. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to ask any questions you have throughout this webinar. We will address all questions we can at the end. We want to make today's webinar a great use of your time, and we believe that starts with getting our audience's input on today's topics. We will be doing that through a few polls during the webinar, and we encourage everyone to participate. Finally, if you have any technical difficulties, you can also use the Q&A function, and a member of the SNC team will try to help. Now that we have those out of the way, let me introduce our panelists who will be sharing their expertise with us. Joe Matamoros has over 20 years of delivering transmission and distribution solutions in overhead and underground switching and protection, power transformers, and control systems. He is currently SNC's product management director responsible for new innovations that improve reliability, reduce carbon footprints, and deliver the best value for customers. We are excited to also have two brilliant engineers from Arizona Public Service joining our discussion today. First, we have Scott McCammon, who holds over 43 years of extensive experience in electrical engineering, including underground distribution, commercial electrical distribution, and transmission systems. He is currently a senior engineer at APS and is a registered principal engineer in Arizona and California. We are also joined by Henry de Villiers, who is an electrical engineer at APS, where he has spent the past six years helping create a sustainable energy future for Arizona. Thank you to our panelists for sharing your time with this group today. Now I'm going to turn it over to Joe, who's going to start us off on why the underground grid is evolving. Thank you, Spencer. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let's start our discussion today with the evolving underground grid. The underground grid is evolving for three principal reasons. The utility industry has been improving customer reliability for decades through undergrounding. This trend will continue and there was renewed attention on underground programs after every notable overhead outage event. Undergrounding also allows us to reduce op ongoing operational costs. This is particularly compelling in a low interest rate environment in which the real cost of capital is low and the return on investment to avoid inflationary operational cost is high. Lastly, advances in equipment, standards, systems, and operating practices have driven continuous improvements to worker safety. These advancements will help reduce the training burden as new generations of line workers and engineers join the workforce. These three trends, increasing reliability, minimizing operational costs, and improving worker safety are being further accelerated by new drivers. Climate change policies, extreme weather events, and changing flood zones are impacting underground distribution operations and planning. These can affect your standards, your planning and construction practices, or in the types of equipment you procure. There is an increased focus on greenhouse gas reduction, including SF6 reduction and reducing carbon footprints. This brings us to a poll question. Are you looking to make a change to your standards due to climate change policies or changing flood zones? If you're considering changes, are you looking at changes across the board for all gear in your for all the gear in your service area, or are you focus more on flooding risk on a case by case basis? Today we'll start by discussing the underground distribution switchgear technology landscape. We'll explain how and why switchgear technologies have evolved in parallel to the underground grid evolution, give you information to assess what solutions are the least cost, best fit for your evolving of requirements. And then we'll hear lessons learned from Henry and Scott from ARPS, Arizona Public Service, 
as to how they address challenges and how they put different underground distribution switchgear technologies into practice. With that, let's take a moment to review the first poll results. So um, it appears that the majority of folks aren't looking at changes at present, and uh, but those who are uh, about 40% are looking at it on a um, surgical basis or, or sort of application by application. Uh, there's about 6% of, of attendees who noted a change across the board. I would say that that's relatively consistent with what we see in practice. And I would say even those who aren't making changes, um, it's uh, still several folks that I'm sure are considering changes, um, you know, location by location at some point in the future. The UDS technology or the underground distribution switchgear technology landscape is quite different than the technology landscapes in other domains like information technology, communications, or electronics. In these domains, the technology changes every few years. In underground distribution technology, in underground distribution switchgear, there are more technology choices available now than there were 20 years ago. And while there are more options to consider now, there are trade-offs to the different technologies We'll discuss today how you can assess which technology is the best fit and least total lifetime cost for your application requirements. Insulation systems are the principal technology differences between switchgear technologies. These insulation technologies impact how the interrupting devices and schemes function, the available electrical ratings, and the features and functions of the switchgear. There are four principal underground distribution switchgear insulation technologies. The first technology is air insulated or unsealed gear. There are, th there are three, character three categories of sealed gear, oil insulated, gas insulated, and solid dielectric insulated. This is an opportunity for a second poll question. Which of these underground technologies do you use today? We will start a discussion chronologically as the technologies evolve. This means starting with air insulated gear. Air insulated distribution switchgear is by far the most widely installed technology. Pad mounted switchgear like the one shown here and metal enclosed gear are ubiquitous in the utility landscape. This gear is used for switching, sectionalizing and protection. Pad mount insulated gear evolved several decades ago from metal enclosed gear in order to provide a standardized and compact solution for underground distribution switchgear applications that would work well within utility right-of-ways. In air insulated switchgear, the switch and fuse compartments are protected and isolated within a grounded enclosure. Uh, before we look further at air insulated gear, let's look at these survey results. All right, so 75% of folks are using air insulated gear, half gas insulated, and about a quarter for solid dielectric and oil insulated. Um, this is a uh, fairly consistent with uh, what would be out there in the market. Um, so I, I appreciate everyone's result or responses there. There are two principal categories for air insulated gear. Live front gear was the first generation of air insulated pad mount underground distribution switch gear. As you can see, as I highlight with the laser pointer, uh, cables are terminated directly in the gear, and when the door is open, the gear front is live. To reduce operator exposure to voltage and to improve cable handling operations, dead front gear evolved later. As I'm highlighting here, the cables are terminated with separable connectors. This presents the operator a dead front when opening the doors. For both live front and dead front gear, the fact that we're using air insulation enables high visibility to the active components of the gear. As I mentioned, air insulated gear, and as shown in the poll results, is the most widely used technology. Uh, and there are two reasons for its ubiquity. One, it was the earliest technology available. And two, it still has several advantages today versus other technologies. The first advantage is that air is simple and effective. There's no need to evaluate the state of health of air insulation. The operator can see the live parts and the state of the gear. Secondly, air insulated gear has been deployed for multiple decades and users and manufacturers have converged on industry standards. This results, the results of this use are a long-term reliability track record and experienced crews and operators who know how to install and operate air insulated gear. From a capital cost perspective, air insulated gear is the lowest cost underground distribution switch gear available. 
Lastly, air insulated gear is relatively lightweight. Less mass and less material means less carbon footprint to manufacture and transport the gear. Air insulated gear doesn't contain any greenhouse gases or, or oil. Air insulated gear does have challenges in an evolving air underground grid. Air insulation requires more space between active parts than other dielectric insulation systems. Accordingly, the product footprint is larger than other technologies. Air insulated gear can't be applied below ground or low grade in areas susceptible to flooding. If you want to keep the switch gear underground and out of the view of the public, then sealed submersible gear should be used. Wildlife, insects, and vegetation can get into air insulated gear. I'm sure many on the call have seen some interesting wildlife uh, make their way into uh, enclosures. Uh, that said, dead front gear is considerably more resilient to wildlife and vegetation than live front gear. Given the climate change policy and flooding concerns I mentioned earlier, you are likely seeing more applications where submersible gear is required. That said, floods will not necessarily damage air insulated gear. However, air insulated gear will not necessarily ride through floods and may require inspection and cleaning after flooding. Lastly, for protection applications, air insulated gear uses fuses. Fuses require crews have sufficient training and use proper operating practices to replace fuses safely. Given the advantages and challenges, let's look at where air insulated gear is applied. Uh, here's a photo of, air, of an air insulated pad mount switch gear used in a feeder application next to a city street. Its low cost makes it the typical solution for general underground distribution for feeder applications and underground residential distribution. It is the lowest capital cost option when you have hundreds of application points. The fact that it's been available for decades has resulted in utilities planning right of way and easements to support its footprint and operating practices clearances. Floodplains are not new and planners have typically avoided siting air insulated switch gear in high flood risk areas. That said, there may be more application points in your service area today that are prone to repeating 100 year floods. With respect to the evolving underground grid, the need for submersible gear drove the development for sealed underground distribution switch gear. The first type of sealed gear we will discuss is SF6 gas insulated gear. SF6 gas insulated switch gear uses SF6 as the dielectric insulating gas instead of air. Uh, here are a few examples of SF6 gas insulated gear of the Vista gas insulated switch gear. Like air insulated gear, gas insulated gear that's in a pad mount application is going to have a, uh, an outer enclosure to prevent unauthorized access to the gear. But in gas insulated gear, there's typically a sealed stainless tank that's a separate component from the pad mount enclosure. You can see the separate tank in the top view on the page here. And then the gear like dead front gear is dead front and uses separable connectors. All right, so let's, let's view some more of the applications where gas insulated gear is applied. Um, it's applied where higher voltages and higher interrupting ratings are needed. For example, 38 kV and 25 kA applications. It's applied in below grade applications like in, in urban vault, underground vaults and in areas that are flown to prone to flooding. Beyond utility distribution, it is widely applied in commercial and industrial applications, uh, such as MUSH applications. Uh, a MUSH is an acronym for a military, university, school, and hospital. For these applications, reliability requirements are high, and there is a need for operator simplicity, since these sites may not have a, a trained medium voltage utility line workers available 24-7 to operate the gear. In addition, many gas insulated switchgear options have internal arc resistance ratings. Uh, again, these ratings are particularly popular in CNI applications. And lastly, gas insulated gear is applied in remote locations where it is impractical to maintain gear regularly, like mines or coastal applications. Gas insulated underground distribution switchgear has several advantages. The first is that there are higher ratings available. Um, as I mentioned, 38 kV and 25 kA applications are more readily addressed in a gas insulated application with a small footprint than what could be achieved with other or what could be achieved with other insulation technologies. Second benefit is the gear is quite compact. Uh, using a sealed dielectric gas like SO6 versus air allows uh, 
a much more compact design. This reduces both the gear footprint and the height. The resulting smaller volume has aesthetic and practical benefits. As mentioned, a key benefit for sealed gear is that it can be operate submerged. Since the active parts are inside a hermetically sealed tank and protected from the environment, there is no regular mechanical maintenance required, unlike other technologies like a medium voltage breaker that would need to be racked in and racked out for maintenance. The next benefits are improving worker safety. Gas insulated gear typically uses resettable fault interrupters instead of fuses. Gas insulated gear allows us to further reduce crew exposure to medium voltage by not using fuses. Lastly, gas insulated gear typically includes three position switches. These switches provide both a visible break that can provide a clearance, and they provide a way to ground cables without removing parking and grounding heavy cables. Gas insulated gear has been implemented for decades. It is not applied as readily as air insulated gear due to several challenges. First challenge is it's gas insulated gear has a higher capital cost than air insulated gear. It is typically not practical to serve all underground distribution switch gear, like underground residential distribution with gas insulated gear. Instead, gas insulated distribution switch gear is typically employed selectively based where the required where the ratings are required, the customer reliability requ requirements and flooding susceptibility. The second challenge is SF6. Even though medium voltage gas insulated switch gear is generally sealed at a factory and does not require gas maintenance or cylinder handling like high voltage breaker applications, there are efforts to phase out SF6 for medium voltage and high voltage for sustainability and regulatory reasons. And while there are no federal regulatory actions underway to phase out SF6, California aims to phase out SF6 by 2031 for medium voltage applications and 2033 for high voltage applications. Uh, let's take a moment for a final poll question. Is your organization looking to reduce SF6 and or looking to reduce its carbon footprint? Given the upcoming phase out in California, and to support corporate sustainability goals to reduce SF6. There are gas insulated switchier alternatives for medium voltage and high voltage that do not use SF6 that are coming onto the market. These alternative gas solutions like Vista Green have the same advantages of SF6 insulated gear. These alternatives do not use any SF6. They are hermetically sealed in the factory and don't require gas maintenance. Given the compact size and low material content, these products have the lowest carbon footprint versus other sealed switchgear technologies. Total carbon footprint is a function of the entire product life cycle from raw materials to manufacturing, to installation and operation, and finally recycling and disposal. Uh, with that, let's review uh, poll results on carbon and SF6 reduction. So what we, uh, a third of folks are looking to reduce their carbon footprint. And I, I pose that question, I'm sure a lot of that's generation things too, uh, and that's great. Uh, and uh, about a third of folks are, are looking to phase out both SF6 and carbon. Um, and then uh, about a third of folks are either evaluating or not considering. Um, it's, it's good to see that uh, many folks are looking to phase out both SF6 and carbon um, as you know, really it's, you should be looking, in my opinion, uh, we're looking at both of those things as we're looking at the future grid is how we reduce carbon and reduce SF6. Thank you for your participation. Like gas insulated gear, oil insulated gear was developed decades ago. It has several of the same advantages of gas insulated gear. It also has advantages in that it does not use SF6. On the downside, like other submersible gear, it has a higher upfront capital cost than air insulated gear. Um, and then oil insulated gear requires regular maintenance. Uh, this is a significant disadvantage to the other submersible technologies available. Oil needs to be regularly monitored and maintained. And as with a leaking distribution transformer, an oil leak uh, of uh, oil insulated gear would require some form of remediation or soil remediation. Uh, lastly, oil insulated gear has a large carbon footprint uh, due to its large mass and higher maintenance requirements. The most recent sealed submersible switchgear technology is solid dielectric switchgear, like the Vista SD product that you see on the page here. Solid dielectric solutions have been developed over the last 15 years, 
due to both a market pull reason as well as supplier push reasons. Beginning in the late 90s, there has been a steady market pull that SF6 could be phased out very abruptly and users would need a no maintenance alternative to SF6 insulated gear. That was a, a, a pull that started in the 90s. On the supplier push, suppliers were able to extend molding technologies beyond molding arrestors and fuses and separable connectors to molding vacuum interrupters inside solid dielectric switch gear. There's also been advancements in overhead reclosers um, in terms of reduce and interrupters in terms of reduced size and use of vacuum interrupters and elimination of oil in those overhead reclosing applications through molding in vacuum interrupters. Um, some of this vacuum interrupter and recloser technology has then been applied in underground. Uh, you know, that said, a dead tank fault interrupter underground application is quite different versus an overhead recloser application at line potential. Um, but with that, let's review the advantages and challenges to solid dielectric technology. The advantages of solid dielectric gear are very similar to gas insulated or oil insulated gear. Uh, like gas insulation, solid dielectric allows a more compact insulation than air insulated gear. Since everything is molded and sealed, uh, there's low or no maintenance required as with gas insulated gear. Uh, there are no fuses to handle, the gear is submersible. And all of the advantages so far are the same as gas insulated gear, where solid dielectric has a differential advantage that, that does not use oil or SF6. On the challenges, solid dielectric gear has the highest capital cost for all of the technologies. Uh, solid dielectric products are heavier and less recyclable than the other technologies. I expect a solid dielectric capital cost premium to persist indefinitely um, versus the other technologies. And, and the reason for that is because they're fundamentally more massive and they require, you know, they require more materials and the types of materials they use, I expect that premium to uh, persist indefinitely. The other challenge is that the technology is newer and more varied across manufacturers. Uh, solid dielectric does not support the higher electrical ratings available with other insulating technologies. There is less consistency across suppliers and the design and operation of the visible brakes. Um, using SD can be a challenge uh, to existing work practices, which require three position switch gear. And, and in air, oil, or gas insulated system, uh, systems, a, a, a user can better assess the technology, the insulation system health. Uh, since those use self-restoring insulation systems versus solid dielectric, which doesn't really have an analogous state indication on insulation health that you would see in as in a gas gauge or oil quality test. And so with that, let's see where solid dielectric is, it can be best applied. Uh, like oil and alternative gas technologies, SD is routinely used where SF6 is not permitted and when air insulated technology is insufficient for the application. SD technologies are well suited for vault applications, like the one shown at right. This application um, allows ready access to the visible brake and the operation. The cables and the operation are on the same side of the gear and the unit can be wall mounted with minimal clearance behind the gear. SD is also well suited for high altitude applications like this photo at right. This is from a ski resort. Um, you know, High altitude SD uh, gas insulated gear, uh, the gauge pressure will increase with altitude and depending on the altitude that could require a uh, high temperature derating. Uh, thank you for your time to discuss the technology landscape. I'm gonna turn it over to Henry to discuss how Arizona Public Service APS puts different switch gear, switch gear technologies into practice. Henry. Thanks, Joe. Um, as, as he said, I'm Henry de Villiers, um, and I'll give you a little bit of background about APS first. Uh, in 1884, the Phoenix Light and Fuel Company was formed to provide electricity and heat to the people of the three-year-old town of Phoenix. Uh, in more recent days, we've come to be known as Arizona Public Service, and we're the largest electric utility in Arizona. And we're the principal subsidiary of the publicly traded Pinnacle West Capital Corporation. And we are regulated by the Arizona Corporation Commission. Uh, I've been told that we are a medium sized utility. Uh, we serve about 1.3 million uh, meters across 11 of Arizona's 15 counties. Uh, we have a uh, 
we're at about 50% of our mix is comes from carbon free sources. And we've uh, self imposed a, a goal of being 100% carbon free by 2050. Uh, much of our current mix uh, and that 50% carbon free uh, comes from our nuclear generation, which is Palo Verde nuclear generation plant. Uh, and that pumps out about 3,300 megawatts of power for us. Uh, takes a little over 6,000 employees to make this all work. And uh, we've got miles and miles of transmission and distribution all over our state. And we interconnect, interconnect with uh, other states around us as well. Uh, back in 2019, we were named one of the top 100 green utilities. Uh, when it comes to uh, selecting the types of insulation that we use in our in our system, um, we we most of our system is handled by air insulated. Uh, as Joe mentioned, it's more cost effective, and being in the desert, uh, mostly in the desert, uh, we have uh, relatively low humidity most of the time, and um, the air insulated works great for us. Uh, that comes in the form of dead front switching cabinets, as well as live front when we use the uh, metal enclosed switch gear, uh, where we have zero lot lines and a lot less real estate to work with. Uh, we also uh, use gas insulated um, switch gear in our networks and vaults and uh, in places where we have to build next to lakes and rivers and things like that. Uh, just because of that added insulation and knowing that we're going to keep moisture and everything out. Uh, with our experience, though, um, in, you, in using the gas insulated switch gear, uh, we have realized the benefits of using that in our pad mounted applications as well. So we have started using gas insulated pad mounted switch gear uh, in places where we maybe don't have the real estate available. Uh, to put multiple, you know, four bay switching cabinets, um, and because of because of the gas insulation, we can squeeze six switches into a much smaller footprint. Uh, we also like to put those in places where it's a little more difficult to get to, you know, Grand Canyon, remote places, things like that, where maintenance and you know setting up routine maintenance can become more of an issue. And with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Scott McCammon to tell you uh, dive deep a little into our system. Thanks, everybody. Hey, thank you, uh, Henry. And good morning, I think, for most of us. There's, um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, and we appreciate your time, of course. We have, um, I wanted to go over a few of our applications that we've uh, have uh, installed. These are more recent applications. And, um, and these applications that are shown here, these are representing some of our zero lot line applications. And especially in our downtown areas in Tempe and Phoenix, Scottsdale, et cetera, they are building basically to the lot line. And so space is a premium and working clearances are also um, uh, much needed, you know, for, for the cr crews to get out there to be able to manipulate these switches or perform maintenance. Um, on the far left uh, is an example of the lot line is literally right at the edge of that concrete. And this is, uh, there's an alley uh, adjacent here to this building. And so it gives plenty of room for um, ac access to this equipment. Um, the middle picture is uh, basically a public street. Uh, and you can see the public sidewalk there as well. And these cities are also looking to screen in the equipment. So that's also been a challenge, you know, to meet our clearances, you know, for safety and, uh, you know, for the crews. Uh, but we are working together with the cities and it's working out quite well. On the far right is an example of the Vista switch gear, like Henry was explaining. This is a six way switch gear. Uh, so it gives us the extra two bays uh, compared to the uh, typical pad mounted equipment uh, with four compartments. 
And again, space the premium. And this is also uh, adjacent to an alleyway and it does have a gate that's open right now. So what you're seeing is actually the termination side, which is crucial, crucial for the crews to have their clearances to be able to um, work on those terminations. And then the control panel side is on the opposite side and there's adequate space for personnel to get back in there. In addition, we're always looking for head clearance to be able to train this equipment in. And this particular switch gear is actually underneath um, a 30 foot high, um, uh, probably third level uh, of the building. So we had to work with them as well to be able to, to determine if cranes could actually fit in the alleyway and be able to pick this equipment if necessary in the future. Um, I wanted to also go to um, another case study where in this one area, it, you know, Phoenix is growing. It's probably, as you well know, is one of the fastest growing areas in the, in the nation. And we just have a lot of real estate here. And we are getting uh, more and more large customers coming in. And in this one area, we actually had three large customers coming in. And of course, um, with great uh, load demands, and when I first got this project, there was already an existing customer and uh, they were being fed directly um, from a substation. Uh, and I believe their loads were um, getting up to about 13 MVA. And uh, as two other customers came into play, we also had to provide for them. And one of the two customers, the second one, if I can refer to it as such, has had a load demand of around 20 MBA, which required uh, another direct feed from a substation. And they also wanted to have some redundancy. So this would have required a second substation, which the timing and the schedules would not permit us to get this substation built. So we came up with a temporary feed from the existing substation. We added a nine bay and a three bay metal enclosed switch gear to be able to feed this 15 bay switch gear for the customer. Um, so it was quite a unique situation. Now, the reason why we ended up with adding the nine and the three bay was to be able to um, handle the loads and uh, for at least the temporary loads for the second customer, but also the third customer was coming in and that third customer had to, was planned to share the same feeder as the first customer. And we had no switching abilities for that first feeder. And so we had to um, install the nine bay and the three bay. So we took the temporary feeder into the nine bay and then over to the three bay and then over to the second customer. And out of that three bay, we backfed the first customer. The nine bay had an AT switch, so we took advantage of that. And, um, as well. And so we went to the adjacent manhole and we were able to uh, first manipulate the switches. So the first customer could be on that temporary feeder as well as the second customer. Since the cu second customer's load wasn't, their initial load wasn't their 20 MVA. And then we were able to um, uh, go to the adjacent manhole and route the first feeder in and out of that nine bay and then we, uh, since then we were able to do a closed transition and get the first customer back on their initial feeder, which also allowed for the third customer come, that could be fed out of this nine bay on that same feeder. And of course, we had to do all this without outages because these are large customers and we're talking, you know, millions of dollars of manufacturing capability a day, right? And, um, this gave us time to build the second substation and also to um, uh, get the new feeders from the new substation to the second customer. And again, with the AT switch capabilities uh, within the 15 bay lineup, we were able to uh, cut them in and out without an outage as well with a closed transition. And, but anyway, thank you for your time. and. 
uh, back to Spencer. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. And uh, thanks, Joe and Henry, for sharing these fantastic insights with everybody today. We have a lot of questions in already, but I want to remind everyone in our audience to please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to post any questions you have. We will get to as many as we can before our time is up. So to start us off, um, I think this one's for you, Joe, is that it says you mentioned recycling a few times. What aspects of the technology you mentioned affect recyclability? Sure. Uh, thanks, Spencer. Uh, so recycling is, is something that I, I think we're going to focus more and more about uh, because it's all part of the total carbon footprint. And as you look at the different technologies, uh, I'll make a couple comments on it. As you look at air insulated gear, if you have uh, the right tools and enough patience, you could almost take the whole gear apart and recycle the pieces and parts. Uh, there's, there's uh, most of it can be recycled. Uh, when we look at technologies like gas insulated gear, that gas doesn't can be reclaimed and should be reclaimed for use in other applications. Uh, when we look at solid dielectric, um, some of the challenges of recycling solid dielectric is, you know, the material that's that's adhering to the uh, to the active parts in that adheres so well. It's, it can be quite difficult to get that material off and that material really can't be recycled other than incinerated. And so, you know, when we look at these different technologies, that's, that's all part of it is what's the plan for the product at the end of life? How much can it be recovered uh, back into new products or, or can the, uh, can the uh, gases and oil and things like that be reclaimed? So, uh, you know, that's all part of the consideration of that total carbon footprint. Got it. Okay, I think this one's uh, for Henry and Scott uh, for sure. Um, it says, as APS as APS's service area grows, what considerations do you make in deciding what type of switchgear to use? Uh, generally, um, because of because of the climate that we live in, um, most of it, as I stated before, is going to be air insulated, just because. Uh, it's more cost effective and uh, with new construction, a lot of times we will have space available to put uh, those air insulated switches. Um, and really uh, when it comes to the other uh, technologies for insulation, it's case by case, depending on how remote it is, whether it needs to be submersible or you know, if we just don't have the space available and then we start looking at uh, metal enclosed switch gear or Vista gear for those uh, applications. Scott, anything else to add? Scott, you're on mute. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, another um, contributing factor too is what are what is the load? So the second case study I gave you or the example, mm -hmm. These uh, loads are quite heavy, so we did require 1,200 amp switch switch gear, whereas the pad mounted which gear that we use is predominantly 600 amp rated for. Uh, and uh, so the load is is also very critical. Got it. Um, another question: uh, What are the what is the impact on ratings due to rising and longer duration in low or high temperatures? Joe, you want to take that one? I'll start and then I'll throw it to Scott and Henry as well. Uh, so, at, you know, switch gear, it, typically the standards are, you know, up to 40 C indefinitely, uh, and then a solar rise on top of that in terms of the, uh, for pad mounted gear. So, you know, that said, you know, that's only about 104 Fahrenheit or something like that. And I'm sure APS, uh, you know, the gear is running a lot hotter than that uh, for a long time. Uh, so I, I think in general, you know, standards, you know, kind of got to that point. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if in the future, you know, we're pushing beyond that. I, I know that we test beyond that as well, uh, but but that's uh, that's where things are from a standards perspective. Uh, Scott and Henry, and uh, the you know how how do you see switch gear performance in the in the middle of the summer, and and uh, what are some of the considerations that you see? Yeah, I mean, we get we get really hot in the summer. Um, you know, we we have days that push 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, I mean, our, our gear seems to perform as, as expected. And there's just, we just have to deal with that temperature. And, you know, um, as, as, as the heat goes up, of course, then our demand goes up. And then um, we, we do end up with feeders that tend to exceed their, uh, their rating. 
and we just know in those situations those switches can't be operated. Yeah, if I may add as well, the um, we tend to only load up our feeders on the distribution side at eighty percent, and once we start creeping in, you know, above the eighty percent, we start referring to them as bottlenecks or whatever, and and uh, try to stay stay ahead of the game. So if there is any derate on on the busing, uh, that that also uh, helps accommodate for that. Excellent. Thank you all. Uh, another question. Um, I, you talked a little bit, Joe, and everybody else about uh, some switchgear that can be buried or put in a vault. Uh, how costly is it to bury the switchgear or put it in a vault compared to just undergrounding switchgear? So it's a. Uh, uh... I think Scott and Henry could also comment on this because I can speak more to the switchgear itself. I, you know, as it relates to switchgear, you know, whether it's in, in a pad mount enclosure or in a vault, it's not significantly different. Uh, the biggest jump is going from air insulated to seal gear. Uh, Scott and Henry, have you had occasion to to, to look at a development where you might want to put something underground, but cost wise, you you decide to keep it above grade, or any thoughts on just in general? what a vault application would entail in terms of cost versus uh, pad mount? I think I might have to let Scott jump on that one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, mainly with our spot network systems, we, uh, and again, with these zero lot lines and the availability of space, you know, that um, also helps us to determine where to go and whether or not it's economical to put something in a vault or not. Uh, we are trending towards um, putting our spot network equipment, you know, about that grade level as opposed to vaults. So that's our first first step. Um, uh, but with these um, spot network facilities, um, generally there may be, um, let's say, um, some good reasons to have it in the vault for security reasons, et cetera, as well. So. But as far as the cost, you know, it's the burden really is placed on the customer in those cases. And, um, you know, it's, it's usually, you know, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, there's there may be some uh, revenue sharing or whatever, but uh, anyway, the, it's really burdened, uh, the customer is burdened with the cost. Understood. All right, next question. Um, and I'm just going to generalize it because uh, can you expand further on the alternate gas to SF6 that you mentioned? I think that's to you, Joe. Sure. So uh, what what we're doing at SNC and and other manufacturers are doing with their switch gear is we uh, are looking at alternative gases uh, to SF6. Uh, so we have a uh, product of uh, the Vista Green design that we released this year that uses a, a di that uses CO2 principally but also uses a um, uh, 3M gas, um, Novec 4710. And together, this is a 97% reduction in the greenhouse gas content of, of the um, versus SF6. And so, uh, you know, that, that's what we're doing here at SNC. Uh, there are high voltage breakers as well that are using the similar technology. And essentially the whole point of it is, is to retain the benefits and things that I went through with uh, SF6 gas insulated gear, but eliminate SF6 completely. Um, in order, you know, there, so there's no federal reporting or anything like that. And, and essentially it uses a gas that has uh, less global warming potential than what's in our cars and, and refrigerators at home. Uh, so it's a pretty exciting development uh, in order to retain a lot of the benefits and ratings of gas insulated switch gear and uh, be able to uh, eliminate SF6. I think this one parallels to that larger SF6 question, but are there any other states or countries that are phasing out SF6 gas? Uh, states, uh, no, there are, I think some open dockets and things people are looking at. Um, I expect there to be more activity on the regulatory front in 2022. California's rules will be ratified uh, in October. And I think that similar to miles per gallon standards in California, that tends to set pacing in other jurisdictions. At the same time, uh, you know, we'll see. I, no one as far as California took, I think, five or six years to get there. Uh, the EU is looking at this as well. Uh, but both the EU and the US are, I believe, from what I've read, are more focused on other uh, 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 fluorocarbons, things that are in refrigerators, as I mentioned. Uh, the, uh, those have been really where the, the focus area is because they're less controlled. 
And I think that just uh, having SF6 alternatives gets us to a point where that's the main emphasis is if, if you have an SF6 alternative, then you know there are other gases that regulators then turn their attention to. But uh, nothing is pending and, and nothing before California and nothing at the federal level. Okay. Thanks for sharing that, that uh, knowledge. Um, question I think that I think all of you can maybe uh, touch on is how reliable is the submersible application switchgear compared to the air insulated switchgear? Okay, I'll, I can start that. So, uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, as it relates to environmental uh, or environmental aspects, you know, steel gear is going to perform at a higher level of reliability just due to that narrow uh, dimension there. I think other than that, um, I, the performance or both are, are, are very high and, you know, differentially not, not too dissimilar. Scott and Henry, uh, maybe that's a question for you uh, in terms of What's been your experience with uh, sealed gas insulated gear versus air insulated gear vis-a-vis -vis reliability? I mean, I can, I can certainly say we've had no issues at all with, with the gas insulated gear operating as expected and, you know, when it's supposed to, um, just, just having that little vacuum interrupter bottle in it that, that takes all the, uh, all the guesswork out of it, I guess. Uh, breaks the load, switches operate nicely. There's less concern about arcing or anything like that. Yeah, and I'm not aware of any uh, comparison study either with uh, with our system. Um, you know, between the two, but um, I don't know. In Arizona, it's fairly reliable. Our our whole system as a whole. So we're got it. Um, I think this question kind of parallels nicely with that one. Um, with gas insulated switchgear, what considerations towards leak impact the overall benefits of the switchgear? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. So uh, in terms of the design of gas insulated gear, it's come a long way in the last 20 years. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, I like to think of it a little bit like submarines and things like too. We don't have a lot of tolerance for leaks in submarines and we have similar uh, lack of tolerance for, for leaks in gas insulated gear, even though the pressures involved are much less. But essentially uh, advancements in sealants and robotic welding and just general design have really cut down on um, you know effective leak rates. Uh, at least has been what I've observed in, in industry uh, over the last you know you know few decades. Um, and you know as we look at carbon footprint, um, you know we uh, you know really there should be no emissions from gas insulated gear. Uh, gas insulated switch gear and things like that at the transmission level, there actually are sometimes prescribed leak rates because just the nature of the gear, it should leak or be ma maintained. The standard for gas insulated gear is 0.1% leak rate per year, although that's considerably higher than what anyone should see. Um, so in general, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's quite critical uh, to, to uh, you know, it's quite critical for the application that it's gonna last for decades. And there's been a lot of um, work by SNC and others to, to really reduce uh, and to improve the product quality over, over the last decades. Um, okay, so another question uh, related to carbon footprint. Are there any carbon footprint standards to determine the total carbon footprint for equipment on the electrical grid? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we started looking at this more thoroughly as we looked at um, Vista Green this year. There's an ISO standard 14067 um, that relates to how manufacturers or even a utility could represent its carbon footprint to its customers. Um, it's essentially a life cycle analysis. Um, you know, a good example of this is we don't want to reduce emissions in one place by putting them overseas or something, right? And so you have to look at the whole uh, chain of the, the products and services we buy. And it's similar to, I noticed on, on, if you buy a flight from Google, you can see the carbon footprint of the flight. Um, and so, you know, they're, I'm sure, using a similar standard to that uh, 14067 standard. Um, in order to make a representation as to how much carbon did this product take to build. And those, those include considerations for recycling and um, emissions as well as operations and maintenance. Um, and so uh, as you start to look at it, it, it can be uh, quite overwhelming and, and uh, in terms of uh, how, how detailed you wanna get, but essentially it comes down to what are the types of materials? What's the carbon footprint of those materials? How much emissions is the product gonna have? Losses, things like that. And that standard is a helpful one. And um, I'm aware of at least one utility that actually 
in their planning, they started to look at that as terms of well, how far does the gear have to move? What's the total carbon footprint? So, um, you know, I know some folks are out there looking at that and adding it to some of their uh, least cost, best fit um, analysis is, is the carbon aspect of it. Got it. Thanks, Joe. Um, Scott and Henry, this one I'm going to kind of throw your way. Um, it's kind of broad, so take it however you think is best. But what can you say about the digitization of Switchgear? Will it represent a revolution for the new generation for a new generation of products? So I guess from your perspectives, do you think that digitization of Switchgear and, and you know it being automated and being able to communicate information is changing the way that the products are used? Absolutely. Um, I mean, if we're, I, I guess, yeah, it could be sort of broad there if we're talking about um, two-way communication. Absolutely. I mean, having having that SCADA uh, on, on switch gear allows us to isolate faults more quickly and um, restore service more quickly and, you know, locate it so that we don't have uh, trouble men patrolling lines, looking for it, they go right to it. So you're reducing cost from truck rolls and um, restoring service. So you're affecting your uh, safety and safety numbers for frequency and duration. So, I mean, absolutely um, digitization of it is it will make a huge impact and it will continue to as, as technology gets more efficient and smarter. Scott, Joe, anything to add? Yeah, I'm not sure I could add to that. I think it's, uh, you know, it's, there's, you know, if there's additional costs, you know, obviously you got to weigh that out and, you know, you're going to have more vulnerable areas than others, right? So. Excellent. Um, this one I think is going to go back towards you, Joe, which is, um, essentially, you know, what is, you know, can the Vista switch using SSS be changed to the new gas that you just talked about, or do you have to replace the entire Vista switch? Yeah, great question. So uh, while the gear is basically the same, there are some changes, one of which is, as Henry mentioned, we use vacuum interrupters in Vista. We generally use vacuum interrupters in a lot of Vista, but there are, are uh, Vista options for load interrupters where they're not, spec they're not required. For the Vista Green, we always use vacuum interrupters. Uh, the other issue is, is that the EPA uh, is preventing the use of the uh, Novec 4710 and applications that have SF6 in it already. They're very concerned. I, the way I understand it is the EPA is concerned that the SF6 and this new get this, this 4710 will get mixed and not disposed of properly. And so they've actually precluded that application from a from an EPA perspective. So so unfortunately it's it's just new gear going forward. But that said, you know, California, even California, which has got the phase out, California is not directing anyone to remove any SF6 from their system. They're just directing the phase out because in the and they looked at this in the EU as well. And removing it, the, the remedy is worse than the, the disease in the, in the sense that, you know, that's where you could have more emissions and you're going to have more carbon and all that, you know, because the gear is, is got such a good leak performance. What we're trying to do is, you know, as new gear phases in either greenfield or brownfield, replace that with non SF6 gear, but no one is recommending to go out and take any SF6 out. Uh, you know, the, uh, the benefit of that is really not there um, versus, you know, a, a more gradual phase out. Got it. Um, Scott and Henry, I think this one is going to go back over to you, just your perspectives. But what from the different four different types of technologies that were covered today, what do you think is the best equipment for confined or tight spaces? It depends. <laughs> That's always the electrical engineer's answer, right? Or response. <laughs> um, again, what is their what are their loads? What are their switching requirements? And then what what types of clearances do you have, right? Um, again, those zero lot lines have really um, challenged us, right? And that's where that Vista switch gear comes in handy. And, um, uh, and um, but I predominantly, let's say on the street, we have, you know, the typical switching cabinet, pad, uh, pad mounted uh, switching cabinet, you know, with four, four compartments. Yeah. Um, 
quick question for Joe, and then I think we'll uh, wrap up with a larger question, but is the molecule, this is specific to the, the I think the green gas you were talking about, Joe, is the molecule of SF6 in the replacement gas larger or smaller than the SF6 gas molecule? Great, interesting question. Uh, so um, as I mentioned, uh, it's two gases that are involved. It's mostly CO2, okay? And that molecule is smaller than SF6. Um, but the uh, 4710, which is basically an additive to the CO2, that molecule is larger. I don't remember the molecular weight offhand, but I want to say it's two or three times the molecular weight of, of um, SF6. But again, it's a mixture. And so, uh, you know, it's, I would say I, um, the, uh, there's actually more weight um, of SF6 in a, in a unit because um, when you look at the actual average um, weight of the gear with the same, um, you, you know, in terms of we're running a couple pounds more pressure, but there's actually less gas in it. Um, so when you mix in the CO2, it actually reduces the average weight, mo average molar mass for the entire thing. So I guess the answer to the question is it's less weight on a molar basis, but the actual uh, 4710 molecule is bigger. But when you look at it as an average with the CO2, it's, it's less. Excellent. Um, I think the last question we'll have time for, and I think everybody could probably touch on this one, but is at the beginning, you mentioned um, undergrounding minimizes operational costs. Can you talk about that a little bit more and help us understand how does undergrounding minimize operational costs? Who did you want to start on that one, Spencer? How about you start, Joe, and then Scott and Henry can add on to it. Okay. Well, from from a from an SNC uh, uh, switchgear perspective, um, you know the uh, underground distribution. You know when you look at a piece of overhead switchgear, it's single pole device. You know you, you got line coming in, line coming out. You know underground, there's a lot of flexibility you can do uh, in terms of how you lay your circuits out. Um, and how you distribute power in a neighborhood, things like that. Um, so, um, you, you know, you can get a lot of switches in a small space. Um, and in general, you know, air insulated gear is, is very good value um, in, in terms of what, you know, air insulated or, or solid dielectric type overhead gear would cost on a per switch basis. Um, so that's, that's kind of a switch gear answer. I think it'd probably be better if it's Scott and Henry address it more system wide. Sure. Yeah. And just, I mean, having, having your system underground means uh, you don't have lines uh, slapping together when you get a windstorm or you don't get tree branches falling across them if you know in that in that same situation so as far as operations and maintenance are concerned uh, you, you I, I believe we save quite a bit on those I mean of course it's it, there's more upfront cost with putting a system underground because there's conduit there's trenching there's digging there's concrete, all that stuff. Uh, but, but yeah, in, in, in our system in our, where we have more underground, it tends to be more reliable and have less, especially, uh, natural occurrences like, you know, wind and lightning and rain and all that. It seems to be a bit more, I don't want to say immune, but less susceptible to, uh, to the elements, uh, really when, when we have issues with the underground system, it's usually because somebody dug into it or, you know, ran their car into a switching cabinet or something like that. Yeah, much more resilient. Um, so before we wrap up, I just wanted to maybe give each of our panelists the time to share, you know, one big idea. If you were to share with this audience one big idea of the evolution of underground uh, distribution switch here, you know, from your perspectives, uh, what would it be? In, in less than a minute, if you would. Okay. Joe? I'll go. I'll go first and give the others uh, some time to think about that. That's a that's a tough challenge, Spencer. Uh, so I think, uh, for, from my perspective, the the big idea here is that um, as we move forward into a you know sustainable grid future, um, you know one that we're going to support DG and DER and all this other stuff, you know we let's you know think about how switchgear and, and undergrounding will help enable that future, and that we're really focused on the total carbon reduction. Um, and not just something very narrow of, you know, SF6 or fuses or what have you. It's just, you know, how can we support interconnection and, 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 and better service and, 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 and um, integrating these distributed resources and doing it in a way that we're ultimately reducing carbon and improving customer sustainability. So that's, that's the one big idea from my side. Scott? Well, it's a reliability uh, piece is very, uh, as 
obviously, uh, but also our cities are requiring more, more and more underground and getting the overhead uh, infrastructure out, out of the cities. Um, and as we're developing, you know, as, as we're going further west and further east, et cetera, we're just, the valley is just expanding. Um, the demands uh, just about from every municipality is asking us to go underground. So underground is coming in and it's growing. Henry? Yeah, yeah I, I would say um, for a big idea, don't, don't accept this is how we've always done it. Let's shake things up. Let's look at it from different perspectives. And yeah, if I had a big enough budget, I'd, I'd, I would, you know, try to underground so much of our system and, you know, try to improve it and start looking at, you know, uh, more greener options and more eco-friendly and, and things like that. So let's shake it up. Awesome. Awesome. Well, excellent. Again, thank you so much. And uh, before we wrap up, I just want to remind everyone, we'll be sending a recording of this webinar and a helpful underground switchgear comparison tool to everyone who attended today. In addition, when you leave the webinar, you will be prompted with a one question survey on today's discussion. We would greatly appreciate if you could spend a few seconds of your time to complete that question before moving on with the rest of your day. With that, I want to thank Joe, Scott, and Henry for sharing their expertise with us. For all those who attended today, thank you for spending your valuable time with SNC. Have a great day.